Hello, my friends. I'm so happy to be with you today. Today, I have the honor of introducing you to Lexi. She is the mom of two kids that she is crazy in love and crazy obsessed with. And her oldest child happens to have alopecia universalis. She has an amazing attitude that she didn't always have. And she will be the first one to tell you that trying to navigate supporting and her own self-talk and all that goes along with having a child who has a very transparent and external difference from others, from peers, is incredibly challenging. And she's very honest about kind of the future and what that will look like for her as they're still navigating it. He's just three years old. One of the other most profound things I think is how much she learns from her partner, her husband, and how the two of them get through things together, which I think is pretty incredible. We didn't get to this part in our conversation, but Lexi very much believes that searching to find a dermatologist who is an expert specifically in this very rare alopecia universalis condition is essential to getting the care that you need. And she also really blends the beauty of Western and Eastern medicine and then looking at other celebrities and pro athletes that may have it as a source of strength, inspiration, and really comfort to her family. So I couldn't be more grateful to share actually our first alopecia story and what it has been like for Lexi's family. Hello, my friends. Welcome to Child Life on Call. This podcast is a safe place for parents to share their stories about what it's like to have a child that has a medical experience, diagnosis, disease, and or everything in between. We know there's power in sharing stories and that power multiplies when you can listen to other parents who have walked a similar path to yours. Giving and getting advice is great, but hearing how another parent navigates the complexities and nuances of healthcare is even better. As a child life specialist, my role is to support, validate, and provide emotionally safe spaces for kids and their families, and I am so honored to be on this journey with you. In addition to parent stories, we sprinkle in some expert episodes every now and again that have content for both parents and professionals in the field of healthcare, all with the mission to empower parents to be confident advocates and partners with the care team during healthcare experiences. We're so glad you're here. Okay, well, it's so fun that we've come to each other by way of future child life specialist. And she actually just got her first job. Did she tell you? Yes. At yeah. Dell. Yeah. Yes. So exciting. I know it's like full circle. Well, I'm so, so thrilled to have you today, Lexi. You. If you would just introduce us to who you are a little bit about you and your family so that others can learn a bit about you. Yeah. I'm Lexi. I'm the mother of two currently. Penn, who's three, he just turned three. My son and daughter is Rooney. She's nine months old. My husband's Jake. We met in Austin. I went to SMU from North Carolina. He swam at the University of Texas, got married right before COVID hit, literally the month before. I think we were like the last party. The last wedding. send off into lockdown in February 2020. And we've been in Austin ever since. And we love kids and we want a million jillion. So Yes. That's, well, yeah. you make really, really cute kids. I follow you on Instagram now, so I'm just obsessed with They're how so horrible cute. they are. I can't. Yes. yes. But yeah, yeah, I'm just a, not just, yeah. I am a stay-at-home mom and it's my dream job and I love it. And yeah. Oh, thank God for people like you. And I love what you said, like not just as, it's the hardest job. I will tell you, like going to work is the easier thing to do. I've heard that from a lot of people. My mom was an assistant U.S. attorney one of the youngest in Texas and gave it all up to raise my twin sister and I when we were born. And so I kind of had that like ideal, like just that picture perfect. I still don't know how she does it. My husband loves when my parents come because like, he's like, this is what a wife is like bringing him snacks, meals, gourmet. I'm like, how did you keep up with three kids and like 50 times more stuff than I do? But yeah, so I have, I have a great role model. Oh, well, Tell us a little bit about your son and kind of finding out that something was going on with him and and what you guys were paying attention to. Yeah. I mean, everything was, he was beautiful birth, full head of hair, healthy. Everything was perfect. Right around eight or nine months old, I noticed some of his eyelashes were missing and he, one of his sleep cues was rubbing his eyes. So my husband and I were just like, wait, is he just rubbing his eyes too much? We don't understand what's going on. And we just kind of kept an eye on it. And then I started noticing little patches 
at around nine months on the back of his head. I mean, like most people I had to like really show them because they didn't see what I was seeing. And I just knew in my gut it was alopecia. I had known a girl in college who had alopecia. My husband had just the year prior developed alopecia for the first time. It's called alopecia barbe. So it was just on his beard. It was just like two patches. And so I just, I just knew it was that. Mm -hmm. And we took him to a dermatologist. She confirmed it. She was like, don't worry. You know, alopecia is typically, you know, the patches, it kind of comes and goes. You can lose more hair with illness or stress or viruses and stuff like that. But she was like, alopecia universalis, where you lose it head to toe is exceedingly rare. It just doesn't happen. And I just knew, I don't know if it was my mom gut, but I just started preparing myself. He's going to lose it all. I just know it. And my husband and I were both, you know, what do they call them? Toe heads, like very white blonde kids. I am very Scandinavian background, like very little, like mm-hmm. hair, very fine. So we just thought maybe it was a little bit of that and a little bit of alopecia, but no, he slowly lost it over the next six months and then it was all gone. Everything. What's so interesting to me is that you kind of knew right off the bat, like a little dime size that was missing told you inside your gut that something was well, going he, on. At the time, he didn't even have that much hair. to Like he was eight and a half months old at the time. So like he didn't even have that much hair. Right. He had just kind of started growing back from the, the newborn shedding. Yeah. And so it was still very fine. And I don't know, I just, I saw the patches and I just knew so. Do you know if it's common for his type of alopecia universalis to start at that young of an age or is it different for everybody? It's different for everybody. His specialist at Dell said he's definitely one of the youngest cases they've ever seen. There are a couple things that make your prognosis worse. One of them is early age of onset. So the earlier it starts, the higher chance you have of it becoming severe or like untreatable. And one of those bullet points that he hits is genetic link. So because my husband had it on his beard that appeared randomly, there is some sort of genetic kind of link at play. And, you know, on my, my mother-in-law has lupus, which is an autoimmune disorder. And my dad has vitiligo, which is just the kind of white spots on your skin. He just has it on his arms and legs and it developed way later in life. But those kind of make you more likely to develop an autoimmune disorder. And that is what alopecia is. So yeah, I just, I kind of knew because he hit those couple bullet points that it would probably progress. You said something interesting and I always wonder what's the response of parents when a doctor tells you something that's like, oh, this is the earliest we've seen or, oh, this is, you know, I once had a mom on the podcast. She told me, you know, the doctor said, my son's the sickest one in the NICU. It's like these things that you don't ever want to hear, but then they're being told to you. What is your response to that? I think my, it's like a punch to the gut. And I think I I mentioned this in our notes, but like my husband is like my North star. Like he is my strength, especially when I don't have any. And he was always like, you know what? It's probably better this way. He's going to grow up this way. It's going to be part of who he is. He will not be easily forgotten. Like Mm. this is pen. And so he was like, if, you know, in his future, it was bound to happen. Let's just say it was, it was triggered one day down the line. Wouldn't you rather him kind of grow into it and know it's who he is rather than, you know, be 15 and going through puberty and like be in middle school and like lose everything. And so I've tried to really train my brain to think about it that way. Like he is who he is. There is a reason for this. He's beautiful. I try so hard to picture him with hair and I can't. Like, I just can't. So part of me just is, Hmm. it's maybe a blessing that it happened as young as it did. Yeah. So that's kind of, that was my husband Jake's process. And now it has become my thought process. But originally it was, it was very much like a punch to the gut. Yeah. I love that perspective. And sometimes you do just like, it's so nice when you're in a partnership or a marriage or a relationship where you both come from different sides because you can really learn a lot from each other. I find that so much with my husband. Like he's just one of those optimistic people. And I swear because of it, we always get a good parking spot when he's driving. (laughs) Whereas like with me, I'm like, we're circling the, you know, like somebody comes in, pulls in front of us. 
And I'm like, oh, when I channel what he does, anyway, it's really helpful. <laughs> no, it's so, I call I call my husband like the human golden retriever. Just <laughs> and nothing ever worries him. He's exactly like my dad. Nothing ever worries them. So like if they ever are worried, then I'm like, oh my God, sound the alarm. Something mm-hmm. like something's wrong. And yeah, so his positivity is really helped. And he's kind of, I'm the, I mean, I'm very anxious, very worry wart by nature, chronic researcher. You know, if my kid has the snipples, I'm on, you know, a Wikipedia wormhole of what it could possibly be. And every time I think there's an emergency or, you know, something's really wrong, Jake is always right. And it's really annoying. Yeah, he's, it is. He's, I've never been right. Not once, except for when I said it was going to progress into losing that hair. I was right that yeah. one time, but I guess it's better that he's always right about these things. Lexi, I think we need to start a support group for yeah. <laughs> overly anxious moms and wives who look up every single thing. So yes, I feel and, you. And whose husbands are like, it's nothing. Yeah, Don't worry fine. about it. <laughs> and they're always right. Oh, annoying. You know? Yeah. So alopecia universalis is kind of this external, you can see it as soon as you look at pen. Yep. Are there any internal or comorbidities or anything like that that you look out for with him? So he is at risk, a higher risk of developing another autoimmune disorder. I believe also asthma is kind of linked and eczema. But the first thing we did when we got his diagnosis was we did a blood draw and we got his thyroid levels checked because they can have thyroid issues. Everything was fine. But yeah. Yeah. So just kind of being aware and paying attention and like keeping tabs on these things. Yeah. There's no other health implications. They're not at higher risk of, you know, any diseases, I mean, other than autoimmune disorders, but nothing like yeah, fatal. I think I don't, I'm trying to think of like a less harsh word to use, no, I, but yeah, I think you're right. I think like the medical term, which I don't like because of the word morbid is like yeah. those comorbidities. I hate or, that word. Yeah. I know it's not a fun one. It's like, but it's not a comorbidity. Yeah. Yeah. I know. The way we use it in like kind of social language doesn't match up with the medical. And what do you know? I feel like it's that with everything in medical. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So because Penn's main issues is kind of external, one of the things you wrote to me is that it's, it's something you're constantly talking about with him. And rather than kind of shying away from or saying it doesn't exist or not looking at it, you guys pay close attention to it. Yeah. We talk about it all the time. I had a very hard time with it in the beginning I mean, he was so young, but I would say, you know, what if it doesn't grow back or what if he loses it all? Like, and from the very start, Jake was like, we're not talking about it like that ever in front of him. It doesn't matter how young he is. We will never speak about it like that in front of him. So I had to really check myself Mm -hmm. and my worry, which like, I think as parents, we do no matter the subject, like if we're worried about something, we never talk about it in front of our kids unless like they need to be involved in it. But Yeah, I had a really hard time trying to frame it positively. But now, I mean, he is early walker, early talker. I mean, he Mm -hmm. he picked up on everything. So I had to really get myself in check pretty early because it was hard. Like if we left a dermatology appointment and, you know, we tracked how much they usually track it by what percentage of the scalp is missing hair. And just kind of as we tracked, you know, 25%, and it was 50, and then it was 75. Like, I would get in the car and just kind of cry. And I had to stop doing that. And we talked to him about it. It's the cutest thing in the world. I say, hey, Penn, you're special. Do you know why? And he says, because I have iapecia. Mm. And we call it the peach. And he talks about how it makes him cute. And we were at a restaurant a few months ago. And we had a waiter who did not have alopecia. He was just bald. But he had a beard kind of a shaved head and in his fifties and Penn goes, mommy, mommy, he's so cute. And he's walked up to us and Penn goes, you're so cute. And he goes, oh, thank you. And I said, why is he cute, Penn? And he goes, cause he has alopecia. He has no hair. And I was like, you're very right. So yeah, it is something that you see and we can't not talk about. And he has already faced some in his just turned three short years of life, already faced some like pretty hard conversations and social situations. And I guess I should rephrase that. I have faced hard ones. He does not really understand it yet, but it's the first thing you notice about him. And that if you were Jake, you would say he's hard to forget. Nobody forgets Penn Ritter. Like he is unforgettable. But if you're me, it's like, but I want people to see my son for who he is and his heart and his soul and his, you know, empathy and his Mm -hmm. joy for life. 
not his head, but yeah. I can't control that. So that's really yeah. hard. Yeah. I think it's okay to like go in and out of those things too. And if we could all have a little bit of like what your husband has, that would be great. But a lot of us don't. Yeah. And so there's so much learning. And what's really interesting about kids, especially when you're born with something, is that you'll like process it in different ways at different times. So as your brain develops, you'll begin processing it in different ways too. And you'll probably see him respond differently, sometimes really positively. One of the things that a lot of families have said helps is when you prepare for those things. Mm -hmm. And you maybe you see it come through play sometimes, right? Yep. We talk a lot about preparing just ourselves. Like I've almost developed a script that I say okay. when kids point it out, which is very common. It's a little disheartening. And I know that kids are kids. And like the other day, Penn pointed out someone in a wheelchair and like I had to have that conversation with him. And I actually had the conversation with him before because I saw it and I was like, I don't know if he's ever seen somebody in a wheelchair. I'm going to explain what it is. And he thought it was so cool that, you know, this guy got to live on wheels. Yeah. Like he's obsessed with trucks and cars and wheels and <laughs> anything on, on tires. But I don't necessarily think a lot of parents have to talk to their kids about kids mm -hmm. that might be different. I wrote this in my notes, but I grew up, my twin sister was born profoundly deaf, 100%, was one of the first kids ever implanted with cochlear implants. And I watched my mom advocate for her, spend her life advocating for her, read, I mean, she's memorized the Americans with Disabilities Act. She has sued apartment buildings that my sister has lived in in college for not having proper like fire alarm equipment. Like she is yeah, the fiercest advocate. And I try to channel that kind of mama bear energy. But I also try to use these experiences with other kids as like learning experiences. Like they might not have parents that are super present or that teach them about, you know, things that make other kids different. Or you really run into the gamut of, I mean, I've had kids at, it happens a lot at the pool, which I think is normal because like he's also shirtless. So it's just like a, a whole, you're seeing a whole lot of skin. And he has kids that I call it palming, like a basketball, mm -hmm. like that palm his head and, and Hey, you have no hair. Did you know you, you don't have any hair? Where's your hair? You look so weird. And like at the time, I mean, this was last summer, he was two, just turned two. And he would just kind of like smile at them. Cause like, he didn't really understand. He just right. knew that they were taking an interest in him. So like, right. he was kind of like, Oh, haha, ha, Like they like me. And that I think has been the most heartbreaking thing to see. Cause it kind of continues to this day. Like I will hear and see kids plainly making fun of him to his face. He doesn't quite understand mm. that. And like watching him wave back or like smile back or like try to talk to them while they're actively like yeah. making fun of him is one of the hardest things that I've had to deal with. Like I've had to yeah. put my hand oh, back. Like I'm, yeah. I, I know. I'm just really <laughs> about like, I want to go find their parents. <laughs> I, I've, in this and, one case I'm talking about, I looked for the parents and I could not find them anywhere. So I know, I know, Otherwise, but I you're, so you're so right. And it's like that it takes so much work to do nothing and it takes yeah. so much work to do something. And you well, kind of also, have to choose like, which one am I going to do today? And like, you feel so guilty when you choose nothing. It's like, mm. I just let these kids make fun of him. And there have been times where I just like, I try to ignore it. And I'm like, they're kids being kids, They've never seen it before. But I go home and I like, why didn't I stand up for him? Why didn't I defend him? Why didn't I, you know, this, this, or this? So I have really worked on developing a script when I hear kids making fun of him or talking to him. Literally last week at the pool, these two, they were probably seven years old, boys were swimming by him and he goes, look at my torpedo. Isn't it cool? And they're like, oh my God, you have no hair. Where did your hair go? What happened to you? And I just looked at them and I was like, hey guys, he's a little bit different, but that doesn't you know, mean anything. He's trying to show you his torpedo. If you could focus on that, he's really cool if you get to know him. So I try to like, I don't know. It's really hard. Yeah. And like when you're on the spot and you're also angry, it's hard oh, to like teach. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I struggle with that a lot. And I also find it really hard to like, we're getting to that age where like, it is really hard to talk about it in front of him. Like, for example, his babysitter downstairs walked in and she's, this her first time meeting him. And it struck me, I didn't give her a warning or like, do I need to give her a warning? Should mm -hmm. I have texted her? And I found myself 
being like, oh my God, I, I, I think I need to say something, but also Penn's right there and he's listening. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of instinctively was like, this is Penn. He has alopecia, so he doesn't grow hair, but he's really cute and funny. Like, yeah, yeah. He I can't think that's wait to play with you. But it's like, I think you're just constantly like, but is Penn going to grow up thinking that I need to like excuse mm-hmm. this or like preface this or it's like you want them to grow up as normal as possible, but you also want to acknowledge it and like talk to him about it because it is a part of him. But that push and pull is really hard. Yeah. Because you can't ignore it, mm-hmm. but you also don't want to make him feel like something's wrong with him. That's tricky. And we're mm-hmm. still navigating it. Yeah. I can imagine that it will feel like this maybe in 20 years too, like you're still navigating it. And I also like think about the way you were just speaking about your mom and how you saw her as a fierce advocate. And I can imagine that's how Penn will view you, you know? I hope so. Yeah. I also think, I don't know why I feel like I'm going to cry. I also feel like him having this, so many eyes will always be on him. Like Mm -hmm. he will always have eyes on him. And I hope to God, and I know it's who he is inside, but that he will be a leader and he will advocate for others and that he will use that attention for good. Just, you really can't forget Penn Ritter. So like, I hope he uses that to stand up for other kids. And I grew up standing up for other kids and standing up for bullies because I watched my sister go through, you know, trouble and issues with other kids and her disability was very, very invisible being deaf. She's gorgeous, beautiful, smart, but was struggling so deeply on the inside and really damaged her from just a social standpoint. And so I kind of always have just grown up standing up for others. And I hope Penn, I already know Penn will do the same. Mm. And what I see too is that no matter like, the days that are hard that maybe he doesn't stand up or he is noticed a lot, like he gets to come home to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just had this conversation with Jake the other night, but I think my, one of my worst fears is like, you know, in high school when it feels like that's your world, that's your feet, like everything that's going on in high school is like something you're going to remember, or Mm -hmm. it, it feels so big at the time. And then you're, you know, 30 years old later with two kids and a beautiful, happy life. And you're like, I don't even remember my prom dress. Like, I don't remember any of my teacher's names. Like it was so insignificant. And, you know, my parents were right. Every time my mom and dad said, you know, don't worry about this or whatever. And I thought it was the end of the world. It turned out it was so insignificant in my life. And I had this conversation with Jake the other night that I'm just so scared for the day that he stops believing me that he's cute and that he's special and he's important. And like God made him exactly who he was meant to be because I know there's a day that will come where he doesn't believe that. And there will be children that try to like dim his light and steal his shine. And I won't be able to fix it right now. I can. And right now there's nothing to fix because he's never once felt sad or different or upset or, you know, he, he'll proudly tell you he has alopecia and like, (laughs) I don't know. I put a a little hair bow in my daughter's hair. She finally has enough hair to put a little bow in. And obviously I put one in the other day. Penn got a bow and was like, I want to put one in in mine. And I said, Oh buddy, you don't have any hair. Remember? And he goes, I know, but I'm just going to pretend like he's very aware of it. I know those days are coming. And I think every single human on earth faces things, whether invisible or visible And I know sometimes the people that are, you know, making fun of or lashing out or bullying are the ones that are hurting the most. So I, I don't know. I, I hope he grows a thick skin while also like keeping his, his empathy and, and who he is. That's such like a beautiful vision for like every child. I love that. I haven't ever put words to it like that, but it's, it's this ability to be resilient but to also feel, you know, and knowing that you have, he has the safety net of you and your husband and yeah. his sister. Yeah. Jake says that all the time. People that have like done things in life that are like world changers and, you know, they've all gone through something like adversity mm-hmm. makes you stronger. And like, as a parent, 
you can't imagine your child facing an ounce of uh, adversity, like an ounce of, you know, sadness or hurt or like confusion. You, you don't want that, but that's what molds you and shapes you and gets you through hard times. And without adversity, you just, I mean, you're just, what are you? It's just an entitled person with no depth. So Mm -hmm. I, I know I can't protect him from everything. No parent can. I wish, you know, I always say I wish his umbilical cord was still attached. Um, (laughs) One day I'm sure when he's like got BO and kind of on my nerves, I like, I'll be like, okay, time to cut it. But I'm just not, you know, as a mom, you don't want your kids to face anything, but you also know that you have to. And sometimes what they face will make them better. And that's what I I just pray for. Mm. I think I've said this on here before, but I saw this like TikTok psychologist I follow and he said, our kid's job is to grow up and need us less and less every single day. And our job as parents is to let them. And I was like, could you have just stabbed me in the heart instead? Literally throw me off a roof. Yeah. How dare you? (laughs) Yeah. Talk to me like that. (laughs) Yeah. I think I, there's another psychologist that I was watching and he said, a mom's bravest act is letting their child into the world. Like there's nothing more brave or like worse for a mom than having to let their child go into the world alone. It's so hard. It's so hard. And then I don't know how I'm going to do it. You have a, you have the added challenges on top. And I think it's really Mm -hmm. valid to like always have these concerns and these worries about the future. Have you guys connected with like other peer groups or maybe someone older than Penn who has alopecia universalis or their parents or what has that community looked like for you? Not really at all. It's such a rare disease. Like I said, I've reconnected with a college friend who lost everything at like 18, um, went, you know, had beautiful blonde hair and lost it all. And I know that it was so damaging to her psyche and her self-worth. And I think that she used to say, you know, when people said it's just hair, that was so cruel to her because Mm -hmm. she was like, it's my self-worth. It's who I am. It's my like outward appearance to the world. It's not just hair. You know, people have harmed themselves because of it. Like it's part of your identity. So I do have her to lean on. She has two beautiful girls and now a little boy and everyone has hair and she's learned to embrace it. And I have that. There is an National Alopecia Areata Foundation, and they do try to pair kids with mentors. I think you have to be like five or six or seven, like you're a little older. He's still in this like weird age group where like you can't treat it. There's no one else, you know, that I know or anywhere near me that has it. I've connected with one person from my hometown in Charlotte, North Carolina. She owns a bakery and her son had it. So yeah, there's not really... It's a very lonely community. Mm. It makes me want to go research and find all the books and the groups and all of that good stuff. But I know you're right. It also comes with time and there will come a time where you're like, honestly, have the bandwidth. You just had a baby nine months ago. (laughs) You're you're doing a few things. Yeah. You have a few things going on. I actually want to, I've kind of started on it, but I've, I've started writing a book that I hope to, you know, not like, I'm not trying to like publish and be an author, but like that I can at least print on my own and like give to his, my goal is to give it to his class every time he goes to school with like a note to the parents about, you know, who Penn is and what he has. And that that's the least cool or important or, you know, admirable thing about him. And the book I'm writing is, I haven't come up with a title, but it's all about professions that are better without hair. Like my (laughs) husband was a big shot, like D1, college swimmer, always shaving. Being a professional swimmer is better when you don't have hair. You're a lot faster. Like firefighters, like you don't have to worry about your hair getting burned. Doctors, like you don't have to wear the scrub mask. So it's just like, or like NFL quarterbacks, like Josh Dobbs, who have alopecia, universalis, like there are professions where it's better to not have hair. And I just think it'd be a really cute way to talk about it. 
Oh gosh, that's so special. I love that. What a gift even to help the teachers navigate the conversation if they haven't had it before. Yeah, that's tough. He goes to the cutest, sweetest, most nurturing little Mother's Day out preschool. And his teacher this year called me and like wanted to talk to me about it before he started. And I thought that was really sweet just being able to like speak about it. But yeah, it's, it's again, like, do you want to give people a a heads up, but you also Mm -hmm. want the children to like be able to lead with their best selves. And if you don't give them the tools to like understand it, then how do you expect them to like, I get it. They're kids. Kids are kids. Like, yeah. They're going to point out things that are different. But if you give them the right tools to understand that, yeah, he's a little bit different, you know, physically, but he's so much more than his bald head. Mm. Maybe it helps them navigate it as well. Absolutely. What are some of your favorite parts of being Penn's mom? Oh my gosh. Like obsessed. Like <laughs> I call my children unicorn children. Like I'm just waiting for the demon baby to come, but their pen is just, it's so cool because I feel like you read these things, like kids don't develop empathy until they're like three to five. Like it's not a thing that like, that's, you know, innate, you kind of learn empathy and his heart is the most beautiful heart I've ever known. I feel like I've known his soul forever. Like I've known him for three years and I don't understand how that's possible because I've loved him an eternity. He is so funny. He loves people and he just has this joy for life. He's just always happy and he's so sweet. And I feel like, you know, you get scared when you have another baby. Mm -hmm. I gave like, I mean, I gave everything to him. Like I stayed at home with him. Like he was my, we were so attached and I was so fearful of having another baby and like what that would do to our relationship and how it was possible that I could love another baby as much as I love him. Unfounded fears. You love them the same as soon as they're out. Like it's, there's no, for any other mom out there, it just happens. But we prepared him, you know, you're going to have a baby sister. Mommy's going to have to like feed her a lot. Like it's going to, you know, whatever. He was so excited. Her name's Rooney and he called her baby Woonie. And he was so excited for baby Woonie to come. He begged my in-laws to take him to the hospital. He saw me in the hospital bed, could not have cared less about me. Where's baby Woonie? Held her immediately, like burped her back. He just loves her so much. If I walk into his room to wake him up from his nap or like wake him up in the morning and I do not put Rooney in his crib with him, he's upset. He can't wait to get home from school. He FaceTimes me from my husband does drop off some pickups a lot of times. And like, he'll FaceTime me from the car and be like, don't put Rooney down for her nap yet. Like, wait till I'm home. There's never a period of jealousy. He's just the sweetest, sweetest. I just, Mm -hmm. I can eat him. I love him so much. And it's funny because he's typical first child, like a little more sensitive, a little, uh, like just such a good, good kid, good listener, like wants to do right. Like, Mm -hmm. He apologized to me earlier. He goes, I'm sorry, mommy. And I was like, for what? And he goes, oh, I dropped my cup. And I was like, that's okay. Yeah. It's my fault. And I was like, no, nothing's your fault. Like, yeah. It's okay. And, mm-hmm. and Rooney is, I already can see like her fiery, stubborn, like mm-hmm. she'll like headbutt him. She's nine months, she'll headbutt him. And I just feel like she's going to be also a key part of defending him. And I can just see her like punching the lights out of him. <laughs> anyone that like crosses him. So he's got a great little support net. But yeah, my favorite, I don't, I I love him so much. I mm, can't name my favorite thing about being his mom. And then my last question is, what have you learned about yourself throughout this process before becoming Penn's mom? I forgot what I wrote in my notes. So I'm mm. winging yeah. it. That I'm stronger than I think. Do you know what's really interesting is I asked this question and so many moms say I'm stronger than I think. When I wrote that, I was like, I'm sure this is what everyone says. Like it's but it's so it's we, true. You have to show up. You don't you get have a no choice. Choice. Yeah, exactly. Definitely stronger than I think. And that like I think my faith is really important to me. And just it's a lesson in surrendering. Like it's not in my control. I can't control it. And like, there is a reason for this. And I firmly believe that he is who he is for a reason. And he has a purpose in this world. And I always used to say that like pregnancy is 
I've never had to surrender more deeply than when I'm pregnant because I just can't control it. And you can worry about everything that can go, go wrong. So you just have to surrender. But I think being Penn's mom through this journey has just taught me to surrender and just know that it's going to be okay and I can do it and he can do it and I don't have any control over it. I think that's so beautiful and such a good lesson. And that word surrender is really powerful. Yeah. I think it's hard because, and we didn't touch on this earlier, but I actually took my husband and I had him scheduled with a functional medicine doctor literally just last week because I felt like I wasn't doing enough. I wasn't being a good enough advocate. Like I think I had kind of taken a back seat. I listened to all the doctors saying, you know, there's no cure. He's too young for treatment, which we wouldn't treat him anyways because the drugs are so harsh, so many side effects. It's not worth it, especially at his age. But I, I just, I kept sitting with this for the last like six months. I'm just like, why is, how can there be no cure? Like auto, alopecia is autoimmune in nature. And it just means that his body is too inflamed for the hair follicle to get through, for the hair to get through the follicle. That seems like the easiest thing in the world to take care of. He's just too inflamed. So how is there no cure? How can I reduce his inflammation? If I did reduce his inflammation, like what could that look like? What are the best ways to reduce his inflammation? And like, that's not something that I love Western medicine, obviously love Western medicine, saves a lot of lives, but I think that there's a time and a place for alternative medicine Mm -hmm. and Eastern medicine. I suffered from headaches and migraines my entire life. I had been to every neurologist, you know, known to man, no one could cure it until I went to my acupuncturist in Austin, Jing Yu, who literally saved my life. Don't have headaches or migraines anymore. And that was kind of my eye-opening experience into like, okay, maybe it's not, you know, drugs or medicines or nerve blocks or shots or injections or whatever. Like, why don't we try to give the body what it needs to heal on its own? So we saw a functional medicine doctor and we are going to start him on just a couple supplements like glutathione that reduce full body inflammation and just see what happens. Because I just found it really hard to like accept that I couldn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Like, how can I not do anything about it? Like, I don't know. I mean, I had our whole house checked for mold. Like I went down this like wormhole on Reddit of moms being like, my kid had alopecia universalis too. There was mold in her bedroom. We removed it. You know, they grew their hair back. And it's a hard process of like trying to not, you know, get too deep down. I mean, I could get, I could go, I could go deep. Yeah. I could swipe the credit card for a million trillion things and like, go to the ends of the world to find out what can help it. So I'm trying to like really limit myself. And I told this functional medicine doctor, my goal isn't hair. My goal is health. Like if his whole body is inflamed, how can you tell me he's healthy? Like he's Mm -hmm. thriving and vibrant, but like there's got to be something there. So it's a journey and, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to put him on a million supplements and, you know, change his quality of life. But if there's a few things that we can try that will just boost his immunity and reduce inflammation, then I'm going to try it. So that's kind of where we're at with his alopecia now. But that is another really hard thing because it's like, Mm -hmm. how do I tell you to take this medication or, you know, take this supplement? What am I telling you it's for? Like, I just tell him it's so he can grow big and strong like daddy. Like, right. So I just went on off on a tangent, but no, I think that's good because I think sometimes with acceptance, we feel like acceptance means you close the door and walk away, but acceptance can also mean this is what it is. And I'm going to continue learning as much as I can. Exactly. And that's kind of where I'm at. I love him. I Mm. love him for who he is and I always will, but I feel like I owe it to him to explore other avenues. Well, Lexi, thank you so much for your time today and sharing you and your family with us. And I'm so grateful. And we haven't had another alopecia family share yet. So okay, I, can't I was going to say, I didn't hear all of the people who feel more connected because of what you've done today. So thank you so much. Awesome. I'm happy. I wish I could have heard from a mom at this kind of stage yeah. too. So mm. thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you all so much for listening to Child Life on Call. If you head to our website, childlifeoncall.com, you're going to find all sorts of stuff there for parents, professionals, healthcare providers, child life specialists, no matter who you are. Actually, when you just go to our homepage, it'll tell you, it'll help you direct to exactly where you need to go. On that, you'll find opportunities and PDUs for child life specialists, parents. We've got a starter kit for you and clinicians. We even have a clinician course, which teaches you how to be a confident and capable caregiver in pediatrics. We're so grateful that you're here. Please DM us on Instagram. And like I mentioned, when you rate and review this podcast, it helps other families be able to find us. So let's keep doing that. And I will see you again here next week.